uh, ultimately, whenever you will think of Dr. Foster's, that means uh, what is the fundamental focus of Dr. Foster's, you will find that Christopher Marlowe wrote Dr. Foster's at a particular time when uh, sorcery and you see black magic, these were banned from Elizabethan world or Elizabethan England at the time. But at the same time, we can find that there are ample provisions, there are ample references of, uh, uh, to be specific, uh, uh, say secret practice of, of black magic. That's why I Macbeth Middleton which is her perspectives So generally, what you can trace, what you can find here, that in, in this particular reference, we can find that Christopher Marlowe in Elizabethan world or Elizabethan time, ultimately he considered uh, a particular ideology regarding the concept of Faust. Faust came to act a particular legend. And I Christopher Marlowe is a Faust Christopher Marlowe focus uh, inaugurate question. Rather, we, we should find that uh, this particular reference to Faust or maybe Faustus or uh, maybe the theme of Faustus, it is already Chilo because there is a particular reference to German Faust book. And then we can find that some historical perspectives of the English Faust book are always in, in work. She talked into side by side Chilo. If you think about the Fosters, the, the legend of Fosters or maybe Faust book, then ultimately you will find that the primary focus was given uh, to a person who actually defies the, uh, the, the God and the godly benedictions and so. spiritual perspectives, do's and don'ts. Uh, amra jani je basically it act a protestant period je, je period er kotha amra porchi ebong shei period ta te tumi bujhte parbe je uh, thik je rakom roman catholic ra tomar ar ki trinity er te bishashi protestant period e ki hocche roman catholicism er ami ota ke detailing korchi na kintu protestant period e amra dekhte pacchi je somehow ekta uh, roman catholicism er moddhe je somosto problems gulo royeche shei gulo ke niye porobortikale martin luther Actor basic orientation at key structure current among shatter followers that are protesting against the learning conventions of the, the prevalent religious perspectives. If a shade I got taken into Protestantism, as she hmm. then you will find that the concept of Lutheranism and then there came the uh, John Calvin and his followers, and that's why here you can find the Calvinism. Okay, so all these things have to be uh, treated in detail. Okay, whenever we will think about Dr. Foster's. Now, what I'm trying to suggest here that when Dr. Faustus was written, Christopher Marlowe had the foreknowledge about the Faust legend, where a person defies God or maybe the, the do's and don'ts and obligatory principles that have been pasted on them. And ultimately, we can trace, we can find that uh, these personalities, like, like Dr. Faustus, uh, he sails his, his soul okay, to uh, just for the, the vain pleasures of Four and twenty years. So that means eight extra months. Do you have? The twenty-five years old journal. She turned eight that day. I mean, that soul that day. She be clear about it. So, car catch it. So, tomorrow, if you look at Lucifer reference, and then you will find that uh, one minister almost like. She turned out to be Mephistopheles. Even that false hope. What happens after the end of this particular time period? But a a a time period that day. Oh, what happens? Tomorrow, you know, uh, when a public dish almost the Bepesha Pagulo Roche, she almost the life at Ketri, materialist, material prosperity, a magical power. Okay, but she actually spirit a convert to Yacha from a human being. Okay, even she Jagateke Dari, Amra Dikta Paije, uh, fundamentally, uh, there is a particular reference to uh, what should I say that uh, uh, ultimately gaining power in the mortal life, and after that, this particular person was sent to uh, say. Damnation. Okay, damnation that is actually being considered in a typical English society or typical uh, Protestant society as as something that the worst kind of punishment ever possible to a human soul. So it akin to first book in Monday Chilo. Tahole prosnota hoche je whenever we will go with Dr. Foster's by Christopher Marlowe, where lies the basic difference? That means Marlowe Foster's ta konjaga theke alada. It takes into Prothom or the book to Mulbapa to take in the mother of the 
থিঙ্ক অ্যাবাউট ডক্টর ফস্টাস মানে যারা পড়েছো তারা তো ভালো করেই জানো যাদের একটু আইডিয়া আছে এটা সম্পর্কে যে কি হয়েছিল ওই জায়গাটাতে আলটিমেটলি আমরা দেখতে পাই যে মার্লো ডক্টর ফস্টাস পড়তে গিয়ে আমাদের বেশ কিছু আইডিওলজিস গুলোকে নিয়ে জানতে হয় যেমন ধরো ফর এক্সাম্পল Uh, if we have to trace Marlowe's Faustus and its basic, basic implications and its uh, orientations, then we find that Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, it actually deals with the Renaissance idealism. First, Prothom Bapar Jeta, Sheta Hoche Renaissance idealism and mul orientation. Now the question that suddenly arises is that what do we mean by Renaissance idealism? So whenever we will find the, the, the considerations of Renaissance, then you will find that Renaissance, what is the fundamental thing? To me, there are two things side by side. Broche. And ultimately, they are in clash, you see. At one point, there is Renaissance. At another point, there is religion or maybe Protestantism or maybe Lutheranism or maybe Calvinism, whatever you may think. But ultimately, uh, two things are very different. Because the Bible is very different than Protestants or, or religion. Religion, they don't think about this life. That means the earthly life. Uh, because you have to think about the life hereafter. Why? Because ultimately, we find that uh, this earthly life, it has a limitation. Okay, limitations of everything. Because you cannot grab them, you cannot get them properly. side by side. Uh, when you will be in close proximity with God, that particular time is eternal, you see. So whatever, say, somehow, uh, if you uh, commit some kind of sacrifices in, in this present life, then ultimately you will find the blessings and everything uh, in, in the life hereafter, that is in future life. It is into religion preach course to some extent. That means earthly life, material perspectives, all these things have been discarded and they are always thinking about the life hereafter. This is the fundamental focus of the religion, wherever it is the Roman Catholicism or maybe Protestantism or Calvinism, Lutheranism, whatever you may think, but ultimately we'll find that this is the primary focus of religion at the time, right? Think about Renaissance then, another alternative part. The primary focus of Renaissance, you will find that Renaissance is always thinking in terms of the man is the crown of creation, as we know, because Renaissance humanism, the humanistic appreciations, and what are the primary focus of Renaissance humanism, all these things have been uh, uh, taken in consideration probably in your uh, undergraduate syllabus. But what I'm trying to suggest here that the Renaissance aspiration is always focusing on uh, somehow that uh, man is the crown of creation and man should experience Okay, the, the positive resources of life. That means in this particular life, there is everything. So you needn't have to think about the life hereafter, right? So can you find a kind of a stark difference between these two idealisms? At one point, there is Renaissance aspirations that actually bolts ki je amader ei prithibi ta ke niye baatste hobe, amader ei prithibi modhi shob kichu royeche. Shutorang porobotti kaler kono prosongo asche na. Chika chhe, mane tumi joto ta parbe powerful how? You will find them ultimately if you go through the text of Dr. Foster's. Then certainly you will find there are ample provisions where Dr. Foster is actually aiming at becoming God. You see, a sound magician is a mighty God. That prochur ichha roche. She ichha gula to fulfill korte chaiche. Right. So these are the considerations of Renaissance aspirations altogether. Then you will find that uh, religion, religion. Tamar ulto kotha bolche. Je karone jokhon amra Dr. Foster sportte jai. She Dr. Foster sportte ki kintu amader eta ni ekta boroshoro class story ha. Je কোন ফান্ডামেন্টাল ফোকাসটাকে আমরা ফলো করব মানে যেটা ধরো আমরা জানি যে এক একটা দিকে এই টেক্সট একটা রেনেসাঁ প্লে ওকে এন্ড দ্যাটস হোয়াই উই হ্যাভ টু ট্রিট ডক্টর ফস্টাস অ্যাজ এ রেনেসাঁ ট্র্যাজিক হিরো রাইট বিকজ হি ইজ এ রেনেসাঁ ম্যান এন্ড আলটিমেটলি উই ক্যান ফাইন্ড দ্যাট देयर আর অ্যাম্পল রেফারেন্স देयर আর অ্যাম্পল প্রভিশনস হোয়ার উই ক্যান রিলেট ডক্টর ফস্টাস এন্ড ক্রিস্টোফার মারলো অ্যাট দ্য সেম সেম টাইম বিকজ হিয়ার ইউ উইল ফাইন্ড ইন ডক্টর ফস্টাস দ্যাট ক্রিস্টোফার মারলো ইজ uh uh you know that here we find that dr foster is the uh, uh, is a scholar of wittenberg and when you will think of christopher marlowe you will find that christopher marlowe was one among the university scholars so ultimately if you think about renaissance if you think about the waves of renaissance and how it actually influenced the people in general then fundamentally you will find that the 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 first wave of renaissance it actually affected or maybe affected the uh, 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 the university scholars or the, the, uh, who are being considered in history as university wits. And as we know, that Christopher Marlowe was one of them. So Marlowe's Cambridge years and Dr. Foster's Wittenberg years are quite similar to each other. It is at one point, you see. That's why the text has to be treated as a Renaissance play. 
that that the primary orientations of Renesa has to be treated in this particular text, and the character of Dr. Faustus has to be treated as a Renesa man. Okay, so these are at one point you see, but at another point you will find that this particular play is to be treated as a Christian play. Why? Because the the matters of Christianism is always in work. And in this particular form, you will find that it is not simply a Christian play. Rather, it is a particular play that to be that to be noted as a Christian morality play. You see, so what is Christian morality play? So fundamentally, you will find that this particular tradition of morality that we find in general, this morality tradition has to be treated as a part and parcel of the medieval uh, medieval drama. You see, probably whenever uh, you have gone through the history part, that is development of drama. There was ample provisions regarding, uh, you see, the mystery plays and miracle plays and morality plays and interludes. Probably you have remembered all these things, right? So ultimately, uh, if you think about the morality play, you will find that these plays are religion, uh, uh, religious in nature. Ultimately, because they are the morality plays, the primary focus is always given on the the patterns of morality. You see, okay. What is the pattern of morality that each and every time you will find that it is the moralistic discourse that they are creating it must preach a kind of a moral there are ample other provisions you see in morality plays you will find the abstractions who are performing on this on stage because the characters are are, are are abstractions abstraction means that means an abstract concept has to be treated as a character here you will find that in, in christopher marlowe's dr foster's there is a particular reference to seven deadly scenes where you will find the seven deadly scenes like pride and covetousness and lechery and uh, and sloth and gluttony. All these characters are assembling together. So ultimately, you will find that these are not simply characters; they are the abstractions. And at the same time, you will find that in this particular play, there is an ample provision of two particular angels coming side by side: the good angel and evil angel. Throughout the play, you will find that good angel and evil angel they are actually indicating towards the the Faustus's own psyche. Right, these are actually referring to Faustus's positive side, good side, and the negative side altogether. So fundamentally, what I'm trying to suggest is that if you go through the text of Dr. Faustus, then you will find that the primary focus of this text, if we consider in terms of Christian morality tradition, then you will find that it has to be treated as a Christian morality play from the perspective of moral. And what is the moral of the text? In in Latin, there is one particular line that is repeating. And if you go with the Richard Burton edition, that is the film. Where you can find Richard Burton is playing the role of uh, of Doctor Faustus, and Elizabeth Taylor is the playing the role of you know the evil characters you see. So ultimately, you will find there one particular term is being reciprocated there or repeating. It is recurringly used, and this particular term is stipendium picati mors est. What does it mean? The stipendium picati mors est. This is a Latin phrase, and it actually means that the reward of sin is death. Sin, S I N. That means if you are a sinner. In terms of religion, in terms of everything you see, if you were the sinner, then the death must have to be the the result. And remember that it is not the death of your physic or your body. Rather, this particular death is being referred as the death of your soul. You see. So fundamentally, uh, the as I mentioned that uh, so far as the Christian perspectives are concerned, you will find that everywhere the primary focus is given on the the punishment. That means if you were the sinner. The punishment is 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 the worst punishment, and what is that? It is damnation. It is not damnation for some days. Rather, uh, uh, yes, the wages that sin pays the debt, obviously. So ultimately, uh, here you will find that uh, the punishment that that I am trying to suggest here, that is the punishment is the the eternal damnation. And even here you will find that if you go through the text, if you go through the the dramatic version, that is the performance. Then ultimately you will you will find that at the end of this particular text, it's a kind of an horrific detailing of Faustus's uh, perspectives have been taken in consideration. And what is that? Here you will find that Faustus, uh, Faustus's bodies are mangled. You know the, the limbs are mangled, and uh, Lucifer and Mephistopheles and all the hellish regions are coming from the underworld. They are taking Faustus, and Faustus is crying. Uh, please save me and please may pardon me and so and so. So ultimately, it is a kind of an horrific detail of Faustus's end that have been portrayed by Christopher Marlowe. Why? Because Marlowe's primary trend here, Marlowe's primary focus is to warn the spectators, not only readers. You know, Marlowe is not thinking about readers, uh, but ultimately, that because the drama is made for performance, not for reading. But ultimately, we will find that Marlowe is actually focusing on the kind of a morality that he has to preach in 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 uh, in form of his play, 
and he is actually doing that you see because the, the spectators who are watching dr fosters they have got the foreknowledge they have got the warning from the from the author and from the characters or from the performance that if i go with this particular form if i go with this uh, say the particular kind of a craving that dr fosters had then ultimately i will face the same okay in my life hereafter though you may question in, in the in the present scenario you see that in the materialistic perspective in the in the present scenario always we are thinking about the spiritual perspectives or always we are thinking about the the fundamental uh, reasons regarding the life hereafter and so all these things have been taken in consideration here but ultimately we will find that in this particular play marlow is actually focusing them so what I'm trying to suggest here that whenever you will go with Dr. Foster's, whenever you will go with Dr. Foster's perspectives and the primary focus of this particular play, please try to think about the two different ways, you see. At one point, there is Renaissance. At another point, there is religion. At one point, there is Renaissance humanism. At another point, there is Protestantism and Calvinism and any, many other things, you see, Lutheranism and all these things. Okay. Now, the question is, if Dr. F if Christopher Marlowe, that is a fundamental question that, uh, uh, that is actually being aroused within the students, or maybe when we have uh, read this particular text, then, then that's the same question actually aroused within us, that if Christopher Marlowe is a Renaissance man, then why is the end of Dr. Foster's is, uh, uh, is written in, in such a way? That means if Christopher Marlow was a Renaissance person, you see, that means he is advocating Renaissance, then what is the reason why Christopher Marlow is actually focusing on, on uh, the stipendium Piccati Morses kind of thing? That means reward of sin is death. The fundamental reason probably, probably if you go through the, uh, the Marlow's life, then ultimately you will find that Marlow uh, was a spy. Yes, Marlow was a spy. And it, 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 his, this particular profession was being vested by the king at the time. Okay, James the first, and when Christopher Marlowe was a spy, he had given some kind of uh, privileges or permissions to be specific, and Marlowe actually enjoyed that uh, that licenses to some extent. But Marlowe moved to such an extent uh, that, that particularly, you see that when in Shakespeare wrote, when Marlowe wrote in Elizabethan period and Jacobian period, you will find that homosexuality was a crime at the time in England. You see. But you will find if you go to uh, Christopher Marlowe's uh, particular text, it is uh, Edward II, then you will find that Marlowe is, is preaching homosexuality in Edward II between Gaveston and, and uh, Edward II. So what happens, you know, that Marlowe had the foreknowledge of uh, regarding the power of church. You see that when he is writing uh, uh, Dr. Foster's, okay, he had the foreknowledge about the power of church. He had known everything about Galileo, you see what happened to Galileo in, in past. So ultimately, he had the foreknowledge about other things, you see, that what the church can do. So generally, when Marlowe is writing this particular play, he is creating a kind of an open discussion regarding all these two sections, you see. And fundamentally, you, you will find that uh, Marlowe, uh, to some extent, to some extent, Marlowe was being forced, okay, uh, intrinsically, uh, to to write Dr. Foster's in this particular fashion, probably if he didn't being afraid of uh, uh, Christianity or maybe the the Christian force at the time, then the end of Dr. Foster's might be different at the time. So this is the fundamental reason why Dr. Foster's end is uh, being associated with the Christian perspectives. You see, or Christian. Uh, that's why the text has to be treated as a Christian play more than a play of Renaissance. But the Renaissance is not to be negated. You see. Uh, so let us uh, try to identify the basic topics that you have to go with them. Okay, in Dr. Foster's. Say for example, so the first question is, uh, consider Dr. Foster's as a Renaissance play. Okay, okay, but just uh, here I am recording this particular video, so you will find them in your Google Classroom part. And uh, probably you needn't have to note them down because you can just uh, uh, receive them when you will uh, hear to the listen to the recording again. So just one by one, I will make you uh, uh, mention them. The, so the first thing is Dr. Foster's is a, a Renaissance play. And it is an, a, a tag question that consider Dr. Foster's as a character as a Renaissance hero or maybe the Renaissance tragic hero rather. Okay. Another question is consider Dr. Foster's as a Christian morality play. Okay. So this is another question. <coughs> and then you will find there are ample provisions of the 
of the other references. Say, for example, there is a particular reference where you will find that Dr. Foster's, uh, uh, in Dr. Foster's, there are ample references of, of soliloquies, for example. Okay. Uh, and the, the most important soliloquy is the last soliloquy, where Dr. Foster is pleading towards uh, uh, towards the night that, that it must not end and so. Okay. And he could find the, uh, in, in the firmament, there is a, you know, the, the, the flo floating uh, reference to the Christ's blood as it is the like the ransom and one drop would save his soul. So this is the reference, the a Christ's blood close to the firmament, one drop would save my soul, half a drop, am I Christ? So all these things are there in, in the last section of Dr. Foster's. Uh, so last story okay, is important. Another important part is the, the prologue, that is the significance of the prologue. Another topic is Dr. Foster's is a tragedy of an overreacher, you see. That means here you will find that it is an hubrist character to some extent. Overreacher means that means here you will find a particular meat, a particular kind of a uh, reference is uh, made at the prologue of this text uh, regarding Icarus, you see. Okay, Icarus and Daedalus and the fall of them. So ultimately the concept of overreacher is uh, associated with this. What is the morality play tradition? Seven deadly sins are referenced as the pare, roll up to the character near Hapta Jotan, roll up Mephistopheles as the pare, and Mephistopheles and his conceptions regarding hell, Shetanio Hotepare, what does Mephistopheles think about hell, and so. So these are the topics that you have to go through, and probably as you have the foreknowledge of the text, you can identify that uh, what is happening there and what are the primary focus of this particular text. Chikache, a hoche mota muti ekta kup short ekta outline. Now, uh, I will ask for the questions. Okay. Jodi karo kono query thakar bola, mishita kani talaba bolchi. Second one is the story of. Uh, it is completely different. You see that I, I have taken two particular texts side by side. The first one is, uh, as we see here, it is Doctor Foster's. It's a kind of a tragedy, and the second one you will find it is a kind of a story uh, that is taken from Shakespearean comedy. Okay, and it is a Midsummer Night's Dream, right? So again, uh, I will make a kind of a. Uh, Probably you will find the stories. You see, the, uh, do you have the foreknowledge about the Midsummer Night's Dream? Any, any particular story, any particular reference of that? If you have, then ultimately I can move towards the critical section. But okay, uh, in, in a very nutshell, let us uh, consider the story. You see that uh, in, in our previous lecture, that means in the last class, I have referred to referred about uh, uh, the Shakespearean comedy. What are the basic features of Shakespearean comedy? I have pointed them out. And here you will find that the same thing is in operation in Midsummer Night's Dream. Because you will find, as I mentioned, that in Shakespearean comedies, we generally find that uh, the, the, the particular setting that Shakespeare creates, it's a kind of a make-belief world where everything is possible, you see. Uh, that, that we find in the Forest of Arden or maybe Illyria in Twelfth Night, Forest of Arden in As You Like It. And the similar thing is in Midsummer Night's Dream. Here also you will find that the particular place where Midsummer Night's Dream is taken place, this is the, the, the wood, actually. It's, a, it's an wood, you see. Uh, it's a fairy wood, generally. Hmm. So what happens there? There are ample reference of the characters. What are the characters? At one point, you will find that there are two pairs of characters. One is uh, uh, Hermia and Lysander, Helena and Demetrius. Okay, the, the two pairs. And there is the king. Okay, Theseus is the king. And there is Aegeus and other characters uh, side by side. You, you will go with them with uh, the Wikipedia part or maybe the, st the story matters and so. Or probably if you want, I can uh, provide you in your Google Classroom the, uh, the reference to uh, the story matter. That is the summary of the text. And ultimately, you will find what happens that uh, somehow uh, Hermia and Lysander, these two characters are in love with each other. But ultimately, uh, what happens, you know, that in the typical... Uh, Tollywood film type orientation is there. So you will find that Harmia's father is completely negating that particular match, right? That uh, he says that it can't be possible, right? What happens, you know, that they are trying to elope, elope from the the Athenian or, or Athens, and they are trying to find, uh, that is, uh, Lysander is preparing to go with uh, Harmia and elope from the Athenian court to a particular place that is a remote place where his aunt actually lives. Okay, 
and to go there uh, Lysander prepares for a shortcut route and that is through the jungle that is the jungle of the fairies that is one thing the second thing is, is in the case of the second pair and here you will find that there is a pair that consists of Demetrius and Helena what happens you know that Demetrius loves Hermia not Helena but Helena loves uh, Demetrius right so when Demetrius heard from Helena that Lysander and uh, Hermia they are trying to fly from the court then Demetrius actually follows them right and behind Demetrius there goes Helena into the jungle so there you can find that in the wood that is the jungle there you can get the four characters right now the second group of characters uh, uh, it, it happens to be the in the in the jungle there we can get uh, uh, the fairies you see and there you can get the uh, the, the particular you know the king of the fairies and his name is Oberon right and there is the uh, queen of the fairies he, her name is Titania but eventually Titania brings a changeling boy with her okay and on that particular matter there is a kind of a tussle a kind of a quarrel that is going on between <coughs> uh, Oberon and Titania eventually Oberon has a a messenger or maybe a servant a personal servant a very mischievous servant actually and his name is Robin Goodfellow or in short his name is P-U-C-K Puck okay so what happens you know this this Puck or Robin Goodfellow so uh, ultimately you will find that it is a very mischievous character to some extent that he always creates mischief he always creates some faults and so and so Eventually, what happens, you know, that in that particular jungle, when uh, they are separated, that is Oberon and Titania, Titania is with the fairies and Oberon is along with, with, the, with Park or uh, he, he is alone just taking rest. At that time, Oberon hears uh, or listens to a particular kind of a quarrel that is going on in this wood between Demetrius and Helena. Okay, that particular match which is not possible at the time because there is a kind of a, kind of a clash is going on. Because remember, I have already told you that Demetrius was in love with Hermia, but Helena is in love with Demetrius. So when there is a kind of a face-to-face -face encounter between Demetrius and Helena, then the quarrel moves to such an extent. that Demetrius says, why are you following me? What do you think about me? So these are these things and th uh, these are the things you see. So at one point, you will find that Demetrius is thinking. Uh, at this very moment, uh, or, or yeah, Oberon is thinking that I must uh, do something just to make these particular two characters in a, in a particular note or match. So what happens, you know, that Oberon to treat uh, Titania a lesson, Titania is his wife, Titania is a lesson, he actually uh, orders Puck, that is Robin Goodfellow, to bring a uh, a, a, a magical juice or magical sap from a flower that his name is eglantine from this particular flower he considers or he tells spark to bring a kind of a juice and pour that particular liquid on the sleeping titania so that whenever titania uh, uh, say uh, comes to life actually not comes to life actually when he she is she will awake then ultimately uh, she will certainly uh, fall in love with any particular creature in the jungle. Why? Because that magical sap or magical juice was being uh, prepared from a uh, shot that was shot by the uh, Cupid's arrow. You see, the, the arrow was thrown by Cupid for some particular reason, but it missed the target and ultimately it uh, it was on, on that particular flower and that's why the the matter of uh, you know passion and love and everything is being pasted on this particular flower. So when uh, in the sleep on the on the eyes of sleeping Titania, that particular juice will be applied. Then when uh, Titania uh, will will be awake, then uh, uh, you will find that Titania will certainly fall in love with any particular creature that she will uh, look at look fast at. That's it. So what happens? You know that uh, Oberon, that is the the king of the the fairies. He actually orders or instructs uh, Puck or Robin Goodfellow 
to apply the same portion on Demetrius so that when Demetrius uh, uh, will break uh, his sleep, obviously, and come to life, then ultimately Demetrius will see or maybe his vision certainly fall may fall on uh, <laughs> Helena and the match will be complete because the love affair will certainly be continued. What happens, you know, that this is the second type of character. So at one particular group, you will find the Athenians. That means, you know, the, the, the four characters. The second group here, you will find the, these characters. That is the, uh, you will find the, uh, the, the supernatural creatures, obviously. And there is another third group that is actually uh, the, the group is, was present within this particular jungle. Who are they? <coughs> Sorry. So what we can find here that actually in Athens, there is a kind of a, uh, a, a, a marriage ceremony is going to take place. The marriage between the king and Hippolyta. Hippolyta, as you know, the, the queen of Amazon. So generally, uh, on that particular day, on that auspicious day, uh, the king had summoned the, the group of performers okay, uh, to perform on, on, on the court, actually, or in, in the court of, of the king. Okay? So here you will find that a group of performers, okay, they are eventually coming from the lower part of the society, almost lowest part of the society, because they are, some are the weavers, some are, you know, you will find that uh, uh, some have some apprentices or maybe some persons who are the plumbers. So they are actually gathered to make a kind of, uh, 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 gather to rehearse a particular drama. It's the lamentable comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe. Okay, it's a very uh, uh, ludicrous kind of a uh, uh, tragedy that is being created. You know, Pyramus and Thisbe, this particular story has been taken from Ovid's Metamorphosis. And, and Shakespeare is changing that particular form, you see, to some extent. So what happens, you know, that they are rehearsing within this particular jungle. Then what happens, you know, that this Robin Goodfellow or Park, uh, he actually makes some kind of mischiefs. What are the mischievous things that he is doing? First of all, he mistakes. What happens, you know, he mistakes uh, Lysander, yes, Lysander for Demetrius. And ultimately what happens that this particular juice, that is the love potion, he applies that particular juice on the eyes of Lysander. And what happens, you know, that when Lysander comes to uh, life, um, Lysander awakes, then ultimately he looks at Helena, right? And when he lo looks at Helena, then Lysander begins to speak something, you know, the the amorous words in front of Helena. And then he can identify that the, the fault has been made. And then he applies the same juice on Demetrius. Then at, at one point we find that both Demetrius and Lysander, they are fighting for Helena and Harmia is going around. So such a kind of a hilarious form has been created, you see. At another point what happened, you know, that uh, when this particular juice was applied to or the potion was applied to the eyes of uh, Titania. And then what happened, you know, that one particular character, his name is Nick Bottom. Okay, the, the most boisterous kind of a character in, in, in that particular group, that is the, the working class men. And that particular juice was being applied to Titania. And this Bottom, that is uh, uh, the, the Nick Bottom, he was... Uh, transferred or he was transferred into the uh, with an uh, uh, head of the ass and the sound of an ass uh, is being or to some extent the winning like uh, attributes you see that has, has to be wasted on that particular character and what happens you know that when titania uh, awakes certainly she looks at the the ass headed you see nick bottom and then a particular kind of a romance and romantic affairs is going on between them. Uh, there is a particular say, a reference, there is a particular uh, sequence where you will find that the, the, the sound is there coming from the ass head. And uh, uh, Titania says, oh, such a lovely voice I've never seen again. So these are actually happening. So what happened towards the end? Uh, so you will find a kind of a mischief has been made by Park. The problems have been made. But ultimately, it will be settled by Oberon, okay, where we can find that the, the effect of the potion from 
uh, Lysander's uh, eyes, this will be negated or this will be, uh, to some extent, it will be uh, completely being uh, made off by Oberon. And uh, what we'll find that there is a kind of a match was taken place between, or matching was there between uh, Lysander and Hermia. And here, this particular effect of the potion was continuing within Demetrius. So a match between Demetrius and Helena, it was actually continuing. But the effect was completely made, uh, vanished from uh, Titania because Titania was when the, the effect was uh, made vanished by Oberon. At that time, the antidote has been uh, made actually. Uh, so when Oberon, uh, Titania finds that I am making romance with an, uh, with an ass, then certainly uh, she gets affeared and and she uh, just runs towards Oberon and by thinking that what I have done is completely uh, faulty and I have to think about uh, you only. And then we will find that towards the end of the play, we find that uh, the ass head has been transferred into the normal human being. And at the end of the play, we find that a play was going to take place in the court of uh, the king of this particular place. Okay, because the marriage has taken place, the marriage has been made, and the marriage is regarding these two pairs that have been prepared. And at the end, we will find that the performance by the by the group of, you see, the, the professionals that I have mentioned just now, Nick Bottom and Peter Queens and others. So they are actually performing on stage. So with this, uh, that is Piramus and Thisbe was being performed on stage. So with this particular form, the play has been made to an end. Okay. So this is the story matter, basically. So now the question is, uh, uh, as we can find here, that there are three groups of characters. And Shakespeare, whenever we'll go with the Shakespearean play, ultimately we'll find that how the magic is playing the role, how uh, the, the role of the, uh, you know, the professionals or maybe the play within a play. So let us one by one, I will uh, refer to the story, uh, the, refer to the topics. Okay, I'll try to note them down. First of all, the first question that may arouse in regarding this particular play, you will find that uh, consider this particular play, that is A Midsummer Night's Dream, as a typical Shakespearean romantic play. That is the, the features of Shakespearean romanticism. Uh, sorry, uh, that is the uh, typical uh, romantic play and the features of romantic plays of Shakespearean plays, Shakespearean comedies. These have to be noted and ultimately you have to identify that how so far these particular references, how so far these particular uh, uh, say features can be applied to a Midsummer Night's Dream. This is the si single, this is the first one that you have to answer, right? The second thing was that, that um, uh, think about this particular play uh, uh, as uh, successfully contributing to the society. That means the, the societal class differentiations have been oriented here. Okay, because you will find there are three groups of characters, as I have mentioned. So ultimately, uh, uh, the first group that is made of the supernatural creatures, the second group, they're the Athenians, the third group, they're the, the mortal human beings, but they're coming from the lower section of the society and they are preparing to earn some wages or earn some money and so. So all these three sections have to be treated in detail. Okay, uh, think about the wood. Okay, it's a kind of a make-believe world that Shakespeare is creating. You have to put much more emphasis on uh, the wood and the significance of the wood to this particular play. And at the same time, you can find different characters and their roles. Okay, these are uh, very important for you. And then you will go with the play within a play section. That is the, the that is called metatheatrical concepts. You see, that means there is a play within a play. Because the Pitamas and Thisbe, this particular play was being performed on stage, right? And it is happening to be a play that is within a play, a theater within a theater. That is called this meta theater. Right. So ultimately, you have to go, go with them. And uh, there is other sections, obviously, uh, that is called the uh, one particular theoretical aspect that is that can be used in terms of a Midsummer Night's Dream. And that particular theory is considered as the theory of festivity, you see. It is a kind of festive comedy, almost like that. Because in the theory of festivity, we can find a particular theory that is called Bakhtinian Carnivalesque, you see. There is a particular reference to Mikhail Bakhtin. What is Mikhail? Who is Mikhail Bakhtin? Mikhail Bakhtin was a Russian formalist. One of the particular theories by Mikhail Bakhtin was, uh, to some extent, it is it is called the 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 Carnivalesque theory. Bakhtin considered at the time that uh, Carnival Carnival, you know, that is actually the festival. 
so in the carnival what happens you know the typical social hierarchy you know that within this particular society there is a pyramidal structure you can you can find the apex you can find the base you can find the different kinds of hierarchies in work so ultimately what happens you know that in this particular hierarchy we can find that uh, one particular class is being controlled by other classes right because at the apex there is a particular class he is controlling all the classes and you will find in in the pyramidal structure that is actually happening so what happens you know that bakhtin considers that during a kind of a festival what happens that this certain kind of a, you know uh, this certain kind of a, uh, hierarchy it gets break or broken hmm. so uh, it is kind of kind of excess of uh, wine or excess of alcohol what happens you know that that, that it actually negates any kind of conscious self or conscious mind within you and what happens you know that within the society and societal structure the fundamental representations of the societal structure and the cultural orientation differentiation exploitation different kinds of uh, you know separation or separationist uh, perspectives uh, so all these things have been gone to astray when you are completely drunk when you are completely uh, associated with any particular kind of you see any carnival or any kind of a festival and what happens the bo bottom is up so one particular essay was there regarding that it is called the bottom is up because the name is nick bottom and ultimately we can find that nick bottom is gradually becoming more powerful why because he has become uh, the the mate or to some extent the lover of the uh, supernatural creature the queen of supernatural creatures uh, that is uh, titania so this is a kind of an indication okay that this particular theory probably you will find them in gestor or maybe google scholar where you will find uh, the bactinian theory or, or carnivalist theory in a midsummer night stream then another thing that comes to our, our my mind at the time it is the, the the significance of the title that is you see that the title of this particular play is uh, a midsummer night stream what does shakespeare actually indicate regarding uh, this particular title that is a midsummer night stream what does it mean is it actually referring to why it's midsummer is it referring to the, the matter of sexuality it, is it uh, indicating towards uh, something that can be related with any kind of shakespearean romance or love theme or love affair and so or maybe uh, why it is considered to be dream because it, it cannot be associated with any kind of reality that is why as Shakespeare is creating, you know, in each and every kind of a, uh, of a romantic comedy, as we find that Shakespeare is always in work with a, with a group of performers, with a setting, with a, with a story that cannot be possible in reality. That's why he is creating an imaginary place or imaginary spaces, just like the, the wood where the supernatural beings actually reside, or maybe Forest of Arden, or maybe Illyria in Twelfth Night, or Forest of Arden as you like it. So does it actually indicate that it is only a kind of a dream or rather it's a kind of a, uh, or rather it is actually indicating towards the wish fulfillment because we know that in, in the Freudian con uh, concept that a dream itself actually indicates toward the wish fulfillment. So does it actually refer to the societal perspectives and various kinds of, uh, you know, repressions within you and you will find that it cannot be uh, made in reality and uh, uh, it can only be approved in terms of dream. So, or rather it is being indicated that this particular kind of a dream is actually referring to the dream of these personages and it can be made in real. That's why he is creating the imaginary spaces. So these are the things, uh, probably the love theme is another thing and the supernaturalism, the impact of supernaturalism is another topic that you can answer, you can identify their role, their performances and what affect or what is the effect of uh, or maybe the role of these particular characters towards the maximum perspective of the text the plots and subplots all these things you see that ultimately you have to make a kind of a uh, an umbrella answer you see make a kind of a master note out of them try to identify all these things and try to identify the the topics that are found to be present in your assignment section that is in your uh, module and go with them and probably i i think i consider that this will help you obviously regarding this particular play and there are ample provisions of questions and topics that have been discussed in google sections you see that try to identify them that just uh, go with the story go with the uh, text if possible and then try to identify from google scholar the different kinds different aspects of questions that have been or maybe the topics on which the critical answers have been made you see there is the critical essays okay go with them try to identify the themes and topics and then try to rethink about the text in a different way